start second to the last class who's excited Woo -woo. Really? second to the second to the last oh, okay. next week all right so I ran in, I ran into some plagiarism issues in grading the week 12 assignment or at least suspected plagiarism and so I was like oh man that's a total bummer because I'm always bummed out by that and so I was like, wait, this is totally fitting in with the class. Because we're talking about cost-benefit modeling and ethics. <laughs> All right. So in case you forgot, which is totally cool, um, <laughs> from the syllabus, there's a statement about don't do that. right? And then I tried to remember to state that in the first class, so that was an issue. All right. So in case you were wondering, this is the process through which I go through uh, every time I have to do this. Um, so as you can tell, it's very long. I'm not going to read that out to you. And so you're like, Ben, how is this related to 601? We are in 601 I'm taking data science class. This is not about 601, right? And I'm like, actually, huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, we'll come back. So the point that I'm trying to get across is this process, although it looks very like strange, is very much data science. And I'll tell you why. Um, so notice how it starts out, right? Manually review. So that's very standard data science. Even though I'm teaching you like automation tools, how to use Python, right? Usually a story starts with a person noticing a thing, right? So that's step two is reviewing all this data. I notice a pattern. And then, then like <laughs> steps three and four is where I actually get to use some data science skills. I actually use pandas to review your, your notebooks. Um, and so I use APIs, all this other good stuff. So I use some software to look at every pair of, of, of submissions, right? There's 25 students, so I have 25 times 25 permutations to look at. That's a lot. I don't want to look at all the pairs. And so I use software to do that. And then <laughs> that's where, like, so I use software to sort of augment my capability. And I use the software to figure out what is the highest correlation of the homeworks. And then that's where I go back and I manually review that output. And then I have to go through more meetings and meetings and meetings. Right? <laughs> so, so this is the data science process. I just didn't initially recognize it because I was like, oh, man, this sucks. But so it's like an emotional response to all this process. And it involves all these people. Right? So like, if you're like, ah, oh, this is just like a student and instructor. No, it's all these people. And it has impacts, like second order impacts on everyone. So something that you may not have thought about. And as I mentioned, there's like very, for me, it's like frustrating. But you have these awkward interactions of talking to people. And there's often fear and anxiety. Right? People self-evaluate differently. Um, and these have consequences, right? They're not just things you feel physically, but they have modifications, actions, and outcomes. So all of this is sort of leading up to the fact that I, re I really don't know what the answer is, but there is a cost-benefit calculus whether or not you carry out. Right? There is a benefit to cheating or plagiarism. There is a, uh, a cost to it, but there's also some risk, and this is like, I guess this is one of my teaching points here is like often when you're evaluating risk, the hardest part is you don't know what the risk is. And it's one thing to say like I'm playing the lottery, I can quantitatively evaluate what my odds are. That's almost never the case. It's more often the case that you don't know what the outcome is going to be, you don't know what the association probabilities are, and then you just have to sort of like throw up your hands and hope for the best. So or do the right thing in this case. So that's that's and <laughs> This is quite often when you're, when you're dealing with sort of like subjective processes. Like I outlined a very sequential process that looks very ordered. It's extremely subjective. And so the challenge is when you're evaluating the risk, and the risk depends on someone else's subjective decision making, it gets even worse as far as like trying to prevent. So that's, that's challenging. It's a very common 
cost benefit risk analysis though to figure like what is a thing I can quantify and what's something I cannot. So that's something that we'll review uh, multiple times throughout this lecture. Um, but often you'll run into things that you can't quantify because they're dependent on someone else making a decision. It's sort of up to how they feel that day, which is very hard to include in your data science. Any questions on that? There's just like a quick time. Mm -hmm. So this this is also I run this all the time at work. It's very common. So um, often the people doing the security and evaluation in my environment will never tell you what they're evaluating. And so in a similar way, I will never tell you how I evaluate your homeworks. This is a I will tell you the results. <laughs> and the re so why would so I'm very transparent. I will even tell you why I can't tell you. And, and so the reason for that is if I tell everyone this is my methodology for evaluating the consistency of the homeworks, then you know what will happen? <laughs> we'll, we'll figure out how to play the game. Right? That's what we all do. We play the game. So in my environment, security never tells you what they're evaluating. Right? I will never tell you how I evaluate homeworks. Right? That's just part of the game. Other questions? <laughs> Absolutely, you can try me. I may slip up and be in your favor. All right. So now we're gonna take the the same mentality and we're gonna put it into a business mindset because you're gonna have you you're not gonna be working here at UMBC forever. I hope someday you'll leave here and actually be working for something. Okay. Question. Um, so you can raise your hand or shout it out. What is the language your business organization speaks? Bureaucratic. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? English, that's another good one. All right, one more. What was it? Sorry, I couldn't hear. Professional. Professional. Ah, professional. So, yes. I would. <laughs> that's not one I was expecting, but totally valid. Because, like, if you start swearing at work, you'll be looked down differently. All right. All right, so the and number four, which I was going for, which all those were very good. I mean, so the one I was going for was money. Every business organization speaks money, and that's a common <coughs> language. So that matters to you, even though you're a data scientist, you're not like a, a finances person, you will be forced into speaking money. All right. And and I can kind of feel dirty, right? Like some, I just want to be a pure scientist. I want to be a knowledge worker, right? I don't want to have to deal with all the contracts and the money stuff. Um, right. Typically, just give me the data, and I'll give you a picture and a report, and I, my job is done. And if that's if that's what you do, that's your decision. But I'm going to argue that you're not going to solve the problems that are most relevant to the business. So the the reason to do that, uh, the reason not to just stick in that little silo, is that if you actually want to have an impact, you have to speak in terms that your people who are going to consume that decision or that knowledge. Uh, think in terms of. So you have to start thinking in the same terms that your customers do. In this case, your customers are most likely to be management making decisions about how to spend money in the business. All right. And and if you think that this is just like a, a commercial pitch for like money making businesses, it's not. So other organizations which are not as clearly money oriented still speak in terms of money. So for instance, uh, government where I work we don't make widgets, we don't make things, we don't make a profit. And then you could ask, well, how can you quantify anything if you're not doing anything? Which is a totally legitimate question, but the answer is government still runs on money. It's much harder to talk about because we don't have things that we produce that can be measured, usually. Do you agree with that, other government worker? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's harder, but there's still, I mean, money is resources. Maybe it's yeah. not so much money, but Staffing and money, yeah. So even when you're not making a thing that you can measure, you're still using those resources. Same thing for research. Research is, again, another hard field where you need money to do research, and you're going to spend money to do research. So that means money is part of your game. But in the, in the sense, like you're producing a published paper, how do I, do I measure the number of papers that I publish in research? That's clearly not a good metric, because I could just write a bunch of crappy papers and then have like a high. <laughs> count of papers, but that's not really what you're aiming for. So again, money is common across all these different domains, even if it's not, you know, making All right, so <laughs> once there's sort of like a hard problem, smart people start thinking about it, and so 
there's lots of papers which I'm not going to dive into, but this is a, a an area where other people have done research. Um, I haven't seen anything that really shapes the field yet, so there's lots of papers. None of them are famous enough to sort of like orient towards yet that I found. Okay, so that was all just an advertisement for the fact that uh, cost-benefit analysis does matter to a data scientist, even if you think you're just making plots in Jupyter with Python. Okay, so I don't have like a super formal way of doing cost-benefit analysis other than to say like these are steps that you should think about. And the tricky part is it's almost never sort of an ordered process. Just like in, in data science, it's never like do this, then do this, then do this. It's more like, well, these are all the checklists of things I know I should probably think about, but the order in which I do them sort of depends on the environment I'm in, who I'm working with, information that's available, information that I have to go find. It's, it's much more organic than it is sort of a checklist of steps. So this is just things to think about. Um, and then all of these things, they're not specific to data science, but hopefully what you can bring is a more sort of data-oriented problem-solving problem, uh, problem -solving approach, right? So like if, if someone says, here's all this data in like an Excel spreadsheet and a PowerPoint and a couple dozen Word documents, right? Tell me what's in that, all this stuff, right? Hopefully, um, you can bring a little bit of quantitative attitude towards that. All right. So I'll walk through sort of like my process that I've, I've experienced many times, because my job is basically helping decision makers understand hard problems in a quantitative aspect. And that's not to say that they always use my reports, right? Typically, like they'll be factoring in what is the data science approach tell us, but then also what is the organizational pressure on me, and what are the politics of the people I'm working with? Right. There's other factors besides data science, but I'm going to try and show what, what I go through. So the first step is no one ever says no one ever says to me, Ben, here's the question I want you to go solve. Go do that. Right. It's never that easy. And it always has to sort of like work out of the management. What exactly are they thinking about? And then if they're thinking about that topic, what questions do I think would be relevant? Um, so even just getting a question to be answered is uh, a social problem, I would say. <coughs> so then, uh, obviously, like I'll go into this more throughout the lecture, but creating some sort of mm, relation between the variables that I've identified and the outcomes people are looking for, that's called the model building aspect. The tricky part is you don't want to come up with something random that you just sort of thought of. You're probably creative enough to understand all the problems of the business. And so therefore, an easy way of building a more useful model is to understand how did we get into this state. And the, the reason that's important is because other people have probably faced the same problem repeatedly. And so if you can understand what problems they've faced, then you can have a, a model that is more robust to those aspects. So understanding the history is something that I always try and do. Has anyone here worked in a large organization? Ashreen, have you ever had a documentation of the history of that business available to you? OK, anyone else? Have you guys worked in a business where the history of that organization was available? OK, so how would you go about finding history of an organization where nothing is documented? So there is So for instance, if I'm trying to solve a problem that is faced by management, and, and that problem has been around for a while, how would I know about what approaches other people have taken before with that? Yeah, that's not that right? And, and so what I try and rely on is that social network and people giving me folklore. So folklore is the sort of like storytelling of like, you know, Roger used to work on that project back in uh, you know 1995, and he worked on it for three years, and eventually he got fired, but you know, for the three years that he worked on it, um, he did this, and, and, and he got this data from this person. That, that's the sort of like folklore that I'm referring to. And that storytelling is super helpful because it tells me, oh, Roger's gone now, but the person who he was working with is still here. And they probably don't have the data anymore because that was back like 20 years ago. But maybe they have an idea of like how I should attack the problem. And more importantly, what approaches fail? Because what I'm really trying to avoid is reproducing someone else's failure. Right, so that folklore is where you can sort of learn the lessons from other people. All right, so now you've got hopefully some sort of story in your mind that you can translate into some variables and relationships. That's that model. And then 
from the model, not everything is going to be quantifiable, but typically the things you care most about are, right? So like how much time does it take to do a thing? How much do I have to spend and how much will I earn? Those are sort of the easy variables to always play with. And staffing, I guess, if you throw it there. How many people do I need? All right, so once you have some idea of what you think the model might be, then you need to feed data in order to analyze a, the model. And so this is <laughs> the part that like may sound weird, but getting the data for a model can take years. So do you have a story for that? Um, well, half of our job, it seems, what I do is chasing down the data. It's um, we have access to this data. Is the data in the right format? Is it really an original copy of the data, or is that pool of data that we're accessing a copy or an extract from the original source of the data? Of course, we want the original source of the data. So, you know, in what format can we access that? And are they going to let us? And nobody wants to ever let you access your data. <laughs> <laughs> All right. At least at SSA, I tell you, they're like, no, take it. No. <laughs> <laughs> there, there was a project that I worked on for my work that um, if I had done it you know, in the real world, it would have taken probably about a week for me to do because like, technology is available, measurements are pretty straightforward, and collecting the data is really easy. But in my environment, it took five years. So the problem with that is like, if you're thinking, well, five years, that seems like a long time. The problem is the promotion cycle is one year. Mm. Right? So that means for, for four of those years, I had literally nothing to submit for promotion. Because right? the promotion basically said, nope, still not doing anything this year, and even though I was chasing the data. Next year, nope, didn't do anything this year, still chasing the data. Right, so, so what was holding you up? <laughs> Superb question. What was holding me up? Why did it take five years? All right. So <laughs> it's because typically the things that I'm looking for haven't been done before, right? and therefore policy doesn't exist. And the security folks are really, you know, <laughs> and the data owners, they've never talked to anybody who's interested in their data. So all of these are new conversations for people. If you're doing data science and you're just trying to like extend someone else's project, that's a little bit easier. But if you're doing something novel, it means that you're breaking new ground in the organization. And the organization hasn't been there before, and therefore you will have to be the one to set policy. It's a very um, lengthy process. Yeah. All right, and then even if policy, so it can even so there's creating policy for things that have never been done before. That's cool, but even worse is like when there's a policy that almost applies, but then you have to stretch it to fit your needs. People are very very anxious about that. Right, lawyers are never happy to see you where you have a new use case and you're wondering, huh, how does this work? You know? So, <laughs> um, the data owners finding those guys and working with them might be fun. Okay, yeah. So that's all good stuff. Okay, so now we've gone through chasing the relevant data step four. And then <laughs> finally, right after years of like this hard process of talking to people and getting data, now you actually get to analyze data. And then you can do your presentation. So all of that, right, the only part that really has technically been covered in Data 601 mm -hmm. in the sense of like your skills of learning Python and notebooks and presentation books and plots, it's just one of those little steps, right? And this will take weeks compared to everything else where it might take months. So um, <laughs> hopefully that excites you because that's what you're in for. <laughs> so yeah. Of all those steps yeah. or points, what do you think is the most important? <clears throat> okay, so I have an easy answer for that. Most important. The most important thing is to not do this linearly. So, so what do I mean by that? So if you think of this as like, do step one to exhaustion. Do step two to exhaustion. Like complete it. Right? If that's your attitude, no one will ever understand why you're doing these things. Right? Because they won't be able to see the results until step six. And so there's this thing called the spiral development method. So it's sort of like delivering a very small example of what you mean. And then iterating back and saying, well, you know, we're going to increase the fidelity or increase the resolution of this model. Right? And so it's basically delivering a little taste of your result. So stepping all the way one through six with a very small example. And then reiterating one through six with a slightly better model that people understand more about why it's valuable, but takes more work and time. And then doing it again with an even bigger model, right? But that's the way that you execute those steps or to utilize. Or that's the most, to me, the most important thing. Because otherwise, people don't know why you're doing it and they don't have buy-in. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's my, like, all of this. It's all well and good, but if you don't understand that people 
will not be comfortable with you doing it, you have to tell them why you're doing it. Demonstrate why you're doing it. All right. So all of that is like we set this, we sort of set this up with asking like a business person who wants to make a decision, you're going to go off and figure out how to support that decision. That's sort of responsive, but I'm going to argue you can be proactive. And you just have to understand the environment that you're in a little bit better than most everyone else. So uh, basically, you have to know the patterns of your organization and, and the decisions they're going to face. So if you can anticipate those, you can predict things and be very powerful. All right. So those are sort of all fluff things. Now we're going to try and be a little bit more, uh, a little bit more fluff, and then some technical stuff. All right. So this is a. a when there are smart people, they fall into a trap. And, and you can help them out of this trap, um, even if you're not a smart person. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know. we won't raise hands to see who's in which camp. <laughs> so, so what I'm going to tell you is that smart people like complicated models, because it allows them to A, demonstrate how smart they are, and exercise that intelligence. Those are great things, right? No diss against intelligence. I like smart people. Most of the time, when you're trying to solve problems, the best approach is a very simple one. And the problem with the simple one is that it doesn't flex that intelligence. <laughs> so it, the way I try and think about it is like, what is the simplest model that I can develop that demonstrates the outcome that I'm looking for? And if you can do that, it's going to be much more explainable to the people you have to convince with that story. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I didn't even read it. <laughs> All right. Yeah, if you send it, I'll send it out to the class. Yeah. So, so, Katie Nuggets. Who here has read Katie Nuggets before? One. All right. So we will get that out, and then you'll know that's another good resource. Interpretable models versus Yeah. All right. So the other um, things to think about is that simple models can be done very simply, right? With not a lot of resources, and you're not going to have a lot of resources, so that's a good thing. The reason that smart people like using the fancy models, so if so you've all heard of Kaggle, I believe, that is true statement. So Kaggle has these competitions for data science where you can sign up and compete for some sort of uh, ability to do a prediction in some data set, right? And and what's almost frustrating for me is that when you look at that yeah. model competition, you'll see like the winner won by like 0.001% over the next best team. Right? And from a ranking perspective, that totally makes sense. The person with the best score wins. But the problem is, in business, that's almost never the case. The real application is when you have a model that makes money and it beats the rest of the competition because it gets to market faster, that's the model you care about, not the one that is most accurate. So if you have a model that is 0.01% more accurate than any other model, but it took you know, a year to develop, and is really expensive because it consumes all these GPU resources, that's unfortunate, right? And it's going to lose you money compared to a model that is just slightly not as good, but runs on many fewer computers, is much faster to get to the customer. That's the one that actually wins. So in my opinion, Kaggle competitions are misleading because they tell you to optimize for the ranking, not the actual effectiveness to get to your customer. Yeah, that's my rant on Kaggle. All right, so yeah, I think hopefully this is pretty straightforward, but most of the time a business is looking for something like a break-even decision or uh, you know, how am I going to make on this, this product investment. All right, so <laughs> this is uh, a long story. I'll let you read that, but basically it's the idea that um, you can make decisions that seem suboptimal when you're looking at it. Like, I'm going to let this computer break. That's like a fine decision to make as long as you have the resilience to account for it. Um, so that's sort of how we got to the, the big data environment that we have now is this cost benefit was uh, made. Because previously, before this, we spent a, a significant amount of resources to keep every computer up running all the time. And that used to be the mentality. But it is no longer the mentality. Because someone did the analysis to figure out this is cheaper. You can buy cheaper computers, have more of them, and have them fail more often compared to having computers that run all the time perfectly, but are very expensive. Okay. So that's why we have cloud environment now. All right, a few trade-offs that usually um, 
will crop up over and over, and so it's that useful to have some familiarity with it. Is sort of these short term versus long term, and centralized versus decentralized. So things that you'll see over and over and over in cost benefit analysis questions. All right, and then to get a little bit more specific about what's an example of centralization, decentralization. Again, if you've worked in a large organization, you'll always feel this tear between the IT support folks wanting a central help desk versus IT support being in every office. That's to me the most common example of that. All right. Yeah, so that's one of them. And then the one that I was thinking about having an exercise, but I already have too many exercises in this lecture. So uh, when would you want to exercise at home at that convenience, but maybe less equipment, versus exercising at the gym, where you have lots of equipment, but you're paying a fee? It's an example. All right. Yeah, so this comes up in, in machine learning a lot, um, basically. <laughs> When, when I, I wonder whether the people who are developing all these self-driving cars, when they are looking at model effectiveness, like let's say my model is 99.99% accurate. That's cool, right? Except for that 0.01% where you're in the car and it crashes. Right? So like the, the cost benefit analysis of the model, I'm not sure whether they always build in sort of the, the, the holistic business perspective on, on that model's impact. I don't have good insight on that. All right, finally get to do some exercise. All right, <laughs> so this first one is going to make Ben Monkey up on the whiteboard. So question for you, which one of these would you want to see me do first? And then, by the way, this is a little foreshadowing. Watch, do, teach means you're going to be doing it. All right, so we'll take a vote. How many votes? Do, well, <laughs> let's do this. So you can vote for more than one of that. How many people would like to see me do number one? Two, four, five, five. -ish. Okay. And two. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five. Okay. And number three. One, one, two, three. <laughs> Okay, sounds very interesting. And four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve. All right. Okay. What's number two? Invest in a project or not. All right. These are all very ambiguously worded, so they're not telling you what the project is or any details, right? So it's sort of like a, a relatively generic question. All right, let's see if I can get there. Oop, 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 oop. There we go. All right. So I set you up with some what I call false dichotomies. Right? So like all these questions were A or B. And so whenever my guidance to you is whenever you see a problem where someone is posing you two choices, then you should stop. Stop whatever it is that you're doing and say, you gave me two choices. There's almost never two choices. Right? You should brainstorm alternatives. And so I'm actually going to brainstorm alternatives for each of these cases, but there's almost always more than two choices in, in some situation. Okay. The other sort of like caveat I'm going to put on this is I'm going to sort of break out all the variables and then figure out which ones are quantitative and which ones are not. In this case, what I mean by quantitative is that there's actual data to back up an objective measurement. That's not the same thing as someone doing a survey and saying, please rank this one to five. So when I, when I assign some randomly, well, almost random, but number to uh, some subjective analysis, I'm not including that in is there quantitative data. So you can dispute that with me if you want, but um, making up numbers and then putting them to subjective questions is not relevant to you. All right. All right. So for a breakdown of whether to invest in a project, I try and figure out sort of not just pros and cons, but cost benefits and risks. Right. So if I wanted to invest in a project, I would want, um, you know, versus, let's see. So let's, let's think about what's in a specific project we can. So I want to build a laptop. That's a crazy idea, right? So um, that project will need some investment. I can't do it for free, unfortunately. And so if I wanted to uh, build a laptop, 
Um, the benefit is, let's say I'm, I'm Lenovo in this case, right? So I'm Lenovo, I'm gonna build a laptop. I could take that technology and make a better computer. Right? So I could make a computer that no one has ever built before from existing components. That's very reasonable. But, they claim, right? um, but I could get a product that no one's ever seen before. So that'd be very cool. That'd be a benefit, right? And then because I built the laptops, I now know how to build laptops. That's a skill that can be you know, sold to other people. Right? How I can go uh, build other people's laptops. That's a skill. Okay, so the, the, the problem is it takes a lot of money, right? Building laptops is not cheap, right? Um, and then I have to spend time learning how to do that. So the time that I spend learning doing the laptop is time I can't do other things. So that's a cost. And then, <laughs> given my intelligence on building laptops, there's a likelihood I'll fail. So that would suck, right? But it's totally a possibility. You're <laughs> Large companies fail on product releases. So remember the phone that folds? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like, how did you not realize that a phone that folds is going to break? Did they never fold it? I mean, I just, I'm totally confused by that. <laughs> okay. I mean, literally, I don't know if you watched the YouTube videos on, on this release, but when they got the phone, they pulled it like 10 times and it broke. Like, how did you not realize that? <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> so let's say I'm Lenovo and I don't build a laptop. That might be an investment because Lenovo has a crap ton of money and therefore they just get to keep the money. That sounds like a win, right? <laughs> They're not going to make any money. Right? So they might miss some potential gains, but at least they didn't sort of like, you know, get hit by the, the risk of like spending a bunch of money and then not getting for it. But the problem is if you're Lenovo and other people are building laptops, you're going to be outcompeted in this environment and you're going to lose. So that would be a bad thing. If you don't build a laptop, you're not going to stay cutting edge, and therefore you will fall behind, and therefore you've got a business. So the fact that you saved money up there, no one cares, right? You're not a business. <laughs> so it's not to say you should invest in every project and never not invest, but these are some things to weigh. All right, so once I've done that, this is like a brainstorming of what are the variables. So then once we figure out, okay, those are the variables, now we can figure out which one of those may have some data that I can go chase if I'm not doing anything with the next five years of my life. So for instance, I might be able to figure out what is the cost of building a laptop, right? I could spec out all the components, I could take all the time it takes to do that and sum those up and get a value, right? So that's something that I could probably measure through some uh, previous experience. Maybe someone else has built a laptop. I can go figure out how much they spent on that laptop and then probably make an extrapolation to what it cost me. That's pretty straightforward. How much time, so this is called NRE, non-renewable, non uh, non-recurring engineering. So NRE is this process of, I have to go out and learn a thing. Right? That's a one-time investment. It gets me to be smarter, but it takes some time and money. And so I can probably figure out how long it will take me to learn how to build a laptop. Right? More than a day, less than a year, somewhere in there. And again, I could turn to other people who have done this before and said, Given your background is similar to mine, how long it take you to learn how to build a laptop? Six months? Okay, cool. Try that me too. All right. Now this is the other things that are not as quantifiable. I would say the project may fail. I don't know why it will fail, so I can't really tell you what the odds are of it fail. Okay. <laughs> Often the not investing in a project is going to be harder because you don't know what you're missing. And so the only thing here I have is you could save money, but that's sort of like I just have all this money and I kept it. That's, in this case, you're assuming there's no other topics. Right. So I'm, I'm, I'm in this dichotomy where it's either A or B. Okay, we'll skip. So I think the last slide is, um, so once, so I've done my brainstorming, and then I've figured out variables I could possibly chase. Right. So then the next step is uh, figuring out, is there data available? Right. Can I go talk to people? It's often the case when you're in industry that you literally can't go talk to anybody about their experience because there are other companies who are competing with you, which is very frustrating, right? Like, I'm trying to build a laptop and I'm Lenovo. It's likely that when I ask, hey, how do you build a laptop? They won't tell me. <laughs> so, <laughs> and this can be very aggravating because you know they know, right? But they're not going to tell you because they already know and they're making money off it. Okay. And the other thing that I usually try and ask is like, given a project and I have to make the, the decision, the, the, the management who's going to make this decision about whether or not to invest in a project, do they need your information in the next six months or six weeks? Right? Because if it's six days, I got to 
scale back that model to be a little bit more accessible. Okay, so that's the process that I would go through. I'm gonna skip over all that. All right. So now we're gonna form groups of three. I'm gonna get one, two, three. We'll just count by whatever. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So there's seven groups of three, almost. All right. So then, uh, except for this one, we'll have groups one. So people with the number one will be group one. People with the number two will get three, and the number four will get three. That makes sense. Okay. So there's seven groups of three. Oh, so it's going to have to rotate. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, there we go. <laughs> Math. All right. You ready? You're going to have to, I'm going to give you a number and you're going to keep it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six. So hopefully you remember your number. Find your number. If you're in group one, you're doing one. Anybody Okay, so there are the groups and the questions you're working on. If you need paper, let me know on paper. <laughs> I think we're all y'all have enough problems as I do with my math. So what what is it? Thank <laughs> you. 
Take two more minutes. We'll stop at eight eight o'clock. Thank you. 
Okay. Alright, so now that you've completed this section, the next step is to find someone who did not work on the same problem as you and tell them what it is that you did. With feedback being, you know, are there other things that you can think about that we did not think about? So find someone who didn't do the same project and ask them for feedback. On your analysis. Right. You did some brainstorming, now it's time for critique. <laughs> so critique each other's evaluation and brainstorming. No, <laughs>
So my question, my question for you, if you have not done this exercise before, did you find value from what was the, the lessons that you got out of this exercise? Okay, so maybe brainstorming is important. Would you say maybe collaboration with other people is useful in that sense? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Did you get any value out of this exercise? Okay, so the framework was useful. How do you account for that? Uh, yeah, different perspectives. So we might not go to the problem with that perspective and they would still come up with a solution. But we have the we have different perspectives to solve the problem. Okay. Uh, one last one. We'll get the last one. Nothing else. Okay. <laughs> All right. So you are now on break. We'll come back at eight sixteen.
Okay, so I'm going to get started. I think everyone's back. Uh, so we went through an exercise where we looked at the cost benefit analysis in a very sort of hand wavy method. So we did it on paper, we ver verbally brainstormed, and we got some answers. So for one of those, uh, I think it was the uh, whether to hire or pay overtime wages. This is a pretty straightforward one to actually work out the quantitative analysis in Python. So I'm going to walk you through how I went and developed the notebook for that. All right. So what we did was we looked at the variables, and we figured out which ones of those are quantifiable. And then that means that we can have a model for that. So the model that I'm going to produce is not correct. The reason it's not correct is because it doesn't actually have the right numbers. But one of the secrets to model building is you almost never need the right numbers. What you need is the relations between the values and some reasonable ranges. And so whether the person gets paid $25 an hour versus $20 an hour, does it matter? Absolutely not. Right? It does matter in terms of what the outcome is, but can I build a model without knowing what the actual numbers are? Yes. And so as long as you have some reasonable guess of what the numbers are, you can start building a model. And that's very powerful because it allows you to go to management and say, I built this model. And here are the results with these wrong numbers, right? Fake data. And then they can tell you, well, actually, we were thinking about paying the person $32 an hour. And you're just like, and then your model works, right? Like, that's how magical data science is. is you can do the analysis before you have the right answer. Then when someone tells you, no, it should be this, it's done, right? So that's like the, the trick. There are things I can't quantify. Like, if I tell this worker that I need them there 60 hours a week, Maybe they have some family obligations and they're going to quit. That's something my model didn't build in. So it's not to say models are perfect. It's just you know the best that we can come up with. And all of this is to say you should iterate with your customer, but start simple, right? So my model is very simple. And then I have a treat for you. So after we're done building the Python model, we'll take a look at the Excel model and see how bad Excel is. Because that's typically where people develop models. All right. So. This is what I came up with for sort of like the cost comparison of overtime versus hiring a new worker. So all of these sort of slides are in the slide deck if you want to go back and understand like what was Ben thinking. Um, so there are things that are in the slides, but I let you sort of play the game. All right. So let's take it back. All right. So if you have disputes or questions, now is a great time to raise them because I'm going to walk through this model verbally and sort of walk you through the code about what I was thinking to solve this problem. Not to say it's the right answer. There isn't one, as far as I know. Maybe some economist has worked out with the, the theoretically correct model. Is good number. So the first thing I sort of like play with in my model, the way that I develop models, I say, what variables could possibly be relevant? Right? And then I'll just make up some numbers. So in this case, I have to say, I'm going to either make this person work more Hire someone new at a cheaper rate. Those are my choices. So I assign some variables, and the names are trying to be descriptive. So if you read through those, those should be pretty straightforward to understand. Like why was Ben thinking about hourly wage? Well, that'll probably show up somewhere in the model. Okay. Then some other things that I made up was how long does it take to train a person who's new? This is obviously business specific, and it's something that doesn't have a really firm quantification. Like if I'm a machinist. It may take somewhere between six months for me to become proficient with the machines or 10 years to become an expert. So what does training mean? Does it mean 10 years or six months? Right? That's sort of like a very subjective decision that I made here. It takes five days. So that's a bad thing if you're working because it means boring. the job is really boring. And if you can train someone in five days on the job, bad job. <laughs> <laughs> if you've been in the job and are 10 years later, it's a good job. That's just my bias. All right. And then there's some duration over which I'm making the comparison. So like I assume that people you know, will eventually come upon some, some outcome. So the first thing I do is I say, I'm just going to have this time range 
then I'll look over. Okay. So I'm going to have a list of days. And so here, I have a model that happens to work, but I'm just sort of making things up as I go along. And if they don't work, then I go back and, and clean them up in the code. So choosing a data structure in this case, so I think I probably need a list of days. Maybe it was hours. Maybe I got it wrong. I have to go back. Maybe the dictionary is better. So like sort of flushing this out. Hopefully I did some work on paper before doing this. But. All right. Then I have to um, do some analysis about the data that I, that I have relations on. And so I'm going to look at how the person is getting paid over time. And I need to store all those things in new lists. So I have to make even more data structures here. So I'm going to either spend, uh, I'm going to have a worker produce a widget, right? And I have some number of widgets produced. And I store that into a list. And the list is going to be the same size as the list of days, because that's the number of widgets produced per day. And then I have some money spent training the worker, um, widgets produced by a new worker, or widgets and uh, cumulative money spent on a new worker. So these are just things that I think I will need to develop the model. And then this is, uh, you know, obviously a huge block of messy code, but it's sort of like the the model. Right? So when I say the model, it's the relation between variables in Python. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically think about okay, day one, someone shows up, what happens, right? They start getting trained or they're making widgets. And so that that for loop on the other loop is just I'm iterating through the days as you know they go by. And then ignoring weekends, I'm ignoring holidays, I'm not treating every day as a business day, because those are the only days that matter. So you know the the, the the correctness of this model is very poor in some sense. Okay, so what I wanted to compare was worker who is already an expert versus someone who is I'm bringing in new. And so I'm going to spend um, money on training the worker, so, and I have to pay them at some hourly rate. Uh, and so I'm going, to hunt, I'm going to skip down to the visualization so you can see what's going on. Okay, so this is my sanity check on that code up there. It's just saying, like, over some number of days, I'm spending some money, and that's going up into the right. Mm -hmm. The more time that elapses, the more money I'm uh, spending. So, that's all to, to just say, like, what is this code doing? It's keeping track of money being spent. Okay. So, yeah, so I have to pay the workers some hourly wage, and I have to have them work for some number of hours in a day. And then uh, I didn't plot the number of widgets produced, but it, that's basically the idea. And then, so here, this little if else clause is basically saying, is training going on or not? And the training is going on for five days in this case. So the number of widgets produced is less when the person is in training. After they're trained, then they produce the normal number of widgets per hour. So again, this is some conditional here just to figure out whether or not the person's in training, because I'm looping over all the, the days. Um, okay. So so far, anybody curious about like why is this going up into the right? Yeah, OK, good. Okay, so so now we, we're spending the same amount of money on these two people because we're not paying the trained worker overtime. We're just paying them everybody at the same rate. But um, because the person is in training, they're not producing as many widgets. And so if you look at the number of things produced by each person, it's not the same. So that means that you know, this person who is new spent those five days in training, and therefore they never caught up with the person who was already trained. So from this model, we're spending the same amount of money, and we're getting less from the new person. So that means it's always bad to hire people because they're never as productive as people who are already trained. This is like a sanity check on the model, right? The model produces the thing you exactly expect. So this shouldn't be a surprising. It's actually a good thing. It didn't tell you anything new. It just told you that your model is reasonable. So never hire anybody new. Uh, right. And then, so then you can ask, like, given these two plots, you can say, like, I spent some money and I got some things. What's the ratio of those two? So I want to figure out how many dollars did, it, did I need to spend per widget. And so over time, um, the cost per widget produced by the person who has already trained is constant. Right? They're producing things at a constant rate. Therefore, I'm spending the same amount of money and the same thing. But this person who was in training, didn't do anything useful while they were in training. Right? So slackers. They're not they're in training. And so they didn't produce anything. 
And so they'll always be catching up with the person who was not meeting. So the unit of work here is very easy to measure. It's a widget. It's almost never the case, right? Office workers don't produce widgets. <laughs> you hope not. Okay, so this is just sort of a restatement of the previous slide where they could never catch up. But the cost per widget is always higher. Okay, so that's not to say we should hire new employees. All right, so if I want to produce more things, and I have these two employees, a new employee and a person who already exists. Um, and if I need to produce new things, I sort of have a choice. I could either pay overtime or hire more people. That's a very standard question in business. Okay, so now I'm going to do basically a very similar model with a slightly different calculation. So this is say that same huge block of code we looked at before, except now we've got a couple extra things. So I'm taking that initial model and I'm expanding the scope to be a slightly larger, more complicated, but I've already got confidence the model works with. Not in very cases. Now the trained worker and I'm spending money on overtime to get them to produce more things. Or I want to compare that to um, the new person uh, being then added in addition to the trainer worker. You have two people, right? Rather than just one working extra. So let's get to the punchline on that quickly. So this is sort of like the, the exciting part. So I have this trained worker working overtime, so they're producing more widgets at a slightly higher cost. So the cost per widget is still constant, but higher. And then the other person, I, I brought them in, tra uh, trained them. So during that time, they were producing things, but not as many because they're in training. But now if you have two workers, they can catch up with and exceed uh, the value of that one worker of uh, single overtime. So this is that break even point. This is like the holy grail of business decisions, right? If I can have that situation carry on for more than 20 days, then I'm going to make more money. I go with this second scenario. But if I know that I only need to produce some number of widgets and it only needs to go for 15 days, I definitely should not do that. So that's that decision making process being informed by this break even point. Yeah. So that's. <laughs> So the fun part, though, if you can like convince them of like, here's the pretty picture. Are you on this side or that side? Like the end goal for the management. But <laughs> imagine trying to convince your management about all of that, right? Like <laughs> that's the nightmare, right? The part is here's a pretty picture, but they have no reason to believe you because they have no idea what's going on up here. So that's yeah. Yeah. No, it's not. It's not of course. I'm saying it's not of course. It depends on how long you're running that scenario. Right. As long as you have for long enough, yes. But where is that threshold, right? And so, like, if I only need, a, let's say it's a holiday, right? So it's the holiday season. The holiday season is a very discrete time that ends on like January 25th, 26th, right? Or Black Friday. And so it might be that you only need to do a short burst, in which case you definitely shouldn't hire more workers. It's worth it once you have harder. Okay. Any other questions? There's a lot of side questions. I'll raise that. All right. You're getting other surprises. All right. Yeah. So, other way of sort of thinking about this is like, Number of widgets produced, again, not too surprising. Uh, you can produce more widgets with more people. Sort of an obvious thing. OK, so then the, the funny part is, like, even during that very initial period, so this, the, 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 the break even point is not the same as, like, the costing. So if this is cost per widget at 20 days, but the Number the productivity of the workers is better slightly than the first few days. So the number of widgets produced. Anyways, there's some surprises. All right, so none of that will be believable to your management because they don't speak Python, so you're screwed. <laughs> Not actually. So let's go look at uh. All right, so next spreadsheet. This is what I I always get asked this question of like. Yeah, I don't understand Python. Can you put in an Excel spreadsheet? And the answer is usually yes. 
Oops, I have that up first. Okay, so this is a proof of concept saying, I can take your model in Python and put it into Excel. So this is the same set of data. And you'll see it's the same design. Right? They've got the number of days, the widgets produced by workers, the cost of trained workers, all the same variables, same model. And they go even further, you can produce the same plot. So the problem with this is, when I take this Excel spreadsheet, it's pretty fragile. What I mean by that is like, if I wanted to make my model slightly more complicated, the flexibility of this Excel model is very limited. So the, once you've got a model working, or like first develop it in Excel, and then you move into Python, or maybe a Python model, and you move into Excel, the problem is this is very hard to maintain or change. So if you're, if, let's say I, I learned something new, like the probability of someone leaving is, you know, uh, proportional to the amount of pay I'm giving them and how hard I'm working on the number of reasons. Like, that's a very reasonable thing to add in. It's going to be way easier to add it into your Python model, whereas, like, building that into your Excel model is going to be very fragile. So. This is what you'll typically be asked for, but it's not something that would scale up your world. Yeah, Sam. No, so I... Usually these are one-offs. So like the thing I maintain is the Python model. And if someone wants like a little bit of the day to play with, I'll just manually type it up in Excel. But I, I don't write the Python script. Huh? <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> well, and I worry, right? Because like the visibility here is very poor, right? So let's look at like where did these numbers come from? Well, I have to click on this cell. You'll see what the formula was. and does K14 over J14 make any sense to anybody? It doesn't to me, right? So like, you know, obviously that corresponds to the, the ratio of these two numbers. And yes, you could label those cells so that they do, a form, they do appear in Excel to be a little bit more understandable, but typically this is like why it's fragile. Like if you go and modify this, like maybe I modify this one. And that number changed. But did I really mean to do that? Probably not. Right? I probably meant to change all the values of this formula in this column, but I only changed one. But the visibility of that, nothing. I mean, you have to manually check every single cell to validate is the formula what I expected. It's J14 over J15. Is that right? I don't know, right? So the inspectability of that code is very poor. Whereas, so I might contrast that with, yeah, so I don't know Python, this would be also hard to read, but at least it means something here. It's, a little bit, at least to me, as a Python programmer, easier to understand, and highly visible. <laughs> I got some Snickers there. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so that's that's my beef with Excel. But it's what you'll be asked. All right, I was going to do this. No. <laughs> but usually. The reason that people want Excel is because they want to play with the model. They want to change some value, like number, like here in this model, if I go change hourly wage to 25, everything else updates, right? So that's what they usually want, the ability to play with them. I wouldn't advise writing a Python script to produce an Excel script. Yeah. Any questions on Python and Excel models? You understand that this is all wrong, right? Because the values are made up but the relations are what's important. Okay. Cool, let's go back. All right, so that was basically all technical stuff for the lecture, so congratulations. Ethics and legality. Everybody's excited. No. <laughs> <laughs> this is the part, by the way, that will keep you out of jail, so maybe you should know, pay attention or not, whatever. <laughs> Maybe it won't. <laughs> All right. So my goal, when I, when I get very cautious about teaching ethics and legality because I'm A, not a lawyer, and not B, not an ethicist. So you know, what can I tell you? What I'm going to try and tell you is not what to think, but um, give you a framework for thinking about things. Because I can't tell you what the right thing to do is. That's for you to come up with. But at least I can poke you and say, eh, maybe you should think about this part. So that's, that's my goal for this section. All right. So again, I want you to express your values. I'm not going to try and impose you, try to impose upon you what I think your moral code should be. I can merely tell you the values of coming up with one. 
And then where typically things fall apart is people want to do the right thing, but then when forced into an action in a certain situation, they may not do the right thing. So then you have to figure out where is that disconnect coming from. All right. So if you need paper, let me know. I'm going to run around with the paper. So this is a solo activity, no speaking needed. Is there questions or just talking? I'll give you my favorite example of this. So, like, someone's walking in, or usually they're driving. So, they're driving in front of me, right? Their window is down, a cigarette flips out of the window, the window goes back up, and they drive along. But that's an example for me of someone like taking in action, which I have a moral, ethical stance against doing, and I can't do anything about it right? unless I ram my car. <laughs> so I have not done. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we'll take one more minute.
Okay, so the, my motivation for giving you this time to sort of self-reflect is because if you have a self-image of how you think you perceive yourself, when you're called upon to take action or see something, right, it's sort of that self-accountability of like, how do I think of myself? Now that you've had some time to think about that, when you see something, hopefully you'll respond in the appropriate way, right? rather than just being shaped by the things around you. So having some sort of self-perception of who am I as a person is very useful when you're in certain situations. Right, we'll re-emphasize that later. So I'm not going to be exhaustive in this class. There's a whole actual 605 on this that I'm not going to cover. So um, you know, take that if you like it. There's also an engineering management course. So why would UMBC offer a variety of classes in this domain to people who are working in engineering and science and data science? <laughs> okay, so April says there's a lot of issues. Anyone else? Why is this so relevant to people who are doing technical things? Okay, so you have a lot of control over data. Yeah, so you're going to be in a position of authority and power and knowledge. And that makes you very susceptible to other people needing things and you're getting them. And like, there's sort of uh, tensions and responsibilities in that authority that you have. So people are going to rely on you for technical expertise, but there's also going to be explicit, or sorry, implicit power associated with that responsibility. So operating in a way that is not just beneficial to yourself, but beneficial to those around you is important. So that's why I think we emphasize this. All right. So that, yeah. And then the other point, there's lots of examples of people doing the wrong thing in technical situations. Right? Because there's there's motives that people sort of, oh, I could make a little bit of money because I know this. Right? That's like a, a very standard approach uh, that we see, unfortunately, often. Okay. And on the positive side, there are actually, like, if you wanted to, like, research this, like, the National Science Foundation a few years ago offered a half million dollars to research this issue. Right? So that's that was, to me, very surprising. Because usually the National Science Foundation is, like, go understand this underlying physical concept, right? Here they're asking, like, go understand the responsibilities of this domain. Right? So it's clearly important to the field. Uh, go ahead. Hmm? Is that a question or is it? Is ethics quantifiable? Is it quantifiable so, that I can, like, utilize both? Right. So, so, so I, that, that's why I like having the cost benefit model ahead of the ethics section, is because the answer is probably no. Right. All these things that were not quantifiable, like the risk of somebody being fired, the risk of somebody leaving, the risk of a project failing, there's lots of unquantifiable things in the model. And so our our responsibility as data scientists, my opinion, is to tease out the things that we can do data science on and the things you cannot. So I'm going to hit you with a bunch of sort of like major takeaways so that if you fall asleep and get bored, that's cool. Right. So my major takeaways, so I have a friend who spent uh, decades in prison, and uh, he has some important life lessons that he'd like to share with you. Right. So when someone is running at you with a knife, right, the, the trick is to have already thought about that situation and how you would respond. Because if you sort of respond in the moment, it's less likely to be a good response. So this is merely sort of an advertisement of thinking ahead about things that happen to you and sort of figuring out what would I do in that situation, right? Um, because if you wait until it's happening, you're probably going to do something stupid. Self-preservation is a really high instinct, right? That's something that will emerge whenever you're under stress. And in data science, you will be under stress. Not the same as running at you with a knife, but something similar, right? And so... <laughs> 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 There's not that many next action days, uh, but so you will be under a lot of stress. Typically, stress for you know get the result, do the analysis, get the report out, talk to the stakeholders, convince the customers, blah blah blah. If you're under that kind of stress, you may not sort of think rationally about what are the big picture takeaways that I want to be uh, delivering, and you're going to be more about like how am I going to survive not being fired, and so the immediacy of the threat will sort of drive your stress. 
But if you've thought about the situation ahead of time and sort of planned ahead, that will be A, less stressful, and B, more likely to result in you doing the right thing. <laughs> All right. The other thing that um, you wrote down on a bunch of paper just now in a previous exercise, what you think you would do in a situation where you observe something bad. And I will be highly suspicious that almost no one has the same response to a given situation. And so this is going to cause conflict. So someone else will do something that they think is perfectly legal and right and morally correct, and you'll observe it and you'll say, what was that person thinking? Right? And that's been over and over and over in both little small ways and big, big decisions. And so the, the challenge is sort of understanding how that, that conflict resolves. Because it revol resolves in both like policy methods, so like understanding how an organization governs, governs itself versus sort of like the, the social enforcement of norms. Those are both important to how we resolve differences. Okay. Has anyone here been in like an organizational dispute within their their business? No. Okay. So I I have. So I've been in uh, organizations that supply similar services to another organization. So it's already setting up a conflict because they're both competing with the same customers, um, and they had very different ways of thinking about the problem, and they had different ways of going about solving the problem. And so uh, the takeaway that I, I learned from that was that the right way to frame it was not who's correct, because that's not a helpful mechanism. It means there's a winner and loser. The more helpful approach was when to apply which method to a given situation. And that was a very mature conversation. It meant that both teams had to think in terms of the same language so they could apply the same methodology to analyzing a situation and come up to a decision of who's going to get that problem to solve. So this is a, you know, understanding where the scope and the organizations are, it's all uh, a big mess. But. Okay. So again, just to reemphasize, you're going to be responsible for data. It's almost inherent in your job. You will be the data system, you'll be collecting data that other people, probably, they'll see in isolation, but you'll see as a holistic picture across the, the business. And that's going to put you in a privileged position. Often the data will be sensitive, like addresses and names and telephone numbers and social security numbers and health records and uh, you know, financial data about individuals. So there's lots of information that you'll be responsible for. Hopefully you're not the only person in your organization responsible for all that, but it could be, right? Especially in small businesses where you're the person. Um, and so often you will be looked upon to set policy. And this is a very powerful position. It means other people have to follow your direction on how to handle data. So you might want to read up on, on how to do that legally and legally. Which leads us to, I have shown this slide before early on in the lecture, but it's worth reemphasizing not knowing the law is not a defense for failing at the law. All right, we'll be on break. Take a break until. Uh, let's see, 858, is that everything? Yep. 858. <laughs> 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 we have someone who's observant, all right. All right. Oh, <laughs> Verbal announcement. You guys are very paranoid. Paranoid.
This is a career impacting course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's that differential analysis, right? Like how much, like if you screw up one assignment and it's 0.01% of your grade, like that doesn't matter. But if it's a pattern, all right, we got one more person we're waiting on. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to just keep reemphasizing this over and over. You, as a data scientist, will be responsible for typically pretty sensitive data. Right? So like, even in advertising, so the way advertising works, as I understand it, is you, the consumer, visits a website, and then you leave some information on that website, like the IP address you're visiting from the web browser you're using, the pages you clicked on, right? And then they correlate that with other data that they've we've bought, right? So like let's say all of your voting records, your street address, your name, your email address, all of that gets correlated, right? So it's a huge data science graph of activity of you visiting the sites, going to them. So that the more information they know about you, the better off they can sell a product to you. So better targeting through information quality. The problem is they now have a profile of every single person who's ever visited their website and everyone else. Right. So, you know, what if that falls in the wrong hands? It becomes sort of like a data protection issue. Who gets to access that data? So it gets to be a, a policy of does anyone get to access it, right? So like, you know, there's just a, some bad stories there. So, and Webflix basically the same idea. All right. So, <laughs> the, the unfortunate, sad part in our society, in my opinion, is you are typically do not get to opt into whether or not you share the data, right? By exist by using the data, by using the service, you are the data. So if you're using, so you don't, you're normally not presented with a choice of, can my data be used by this company for nefarious purposes? Yes or no. Never get to opt into that. Right? Yeah. It's more like I chose to use the service, therefore they're going to harvest my data. So the choice is I use the service or I don't. It's not, can I give them my data or not? So, like for instance, if you go to uh, pick on another laptop company like Dell, and you buy that laptop from them, they now have your shipping address, selling address, right, and they can start sending you advertising. And so, because you bought the laptop from that company, they now have your data. You didn't get to send them the indicator of 
I'm buying this laptop from you, but I don't want you to use my data for anything else. That's not a policy that society has set up yet. So that consequence is you, as a data scientist, will have some responsibility to use the data, but also to protect it. All right, so this is now becoming a bit dated, but as a great example, you're probably on Facebook. And so <laughs> even if you have never signed up for Facebook, you're probably on Facebook. Like, that's just facts of life. Is anyone here not on Facebook? Yeah, I won't call you over. <laughs> if you're not on Facebook, you're still have a profile on Facebook. It's how advertising works out. And so that got leveraged by a company who went off and harvested a bunch of profile information and then used it for political purposes. That wasn't with your blessing as a Facebook user. It was because the data existed and there wasn't a good connectivity back to the people who were using it versus the people who were uh, providing it. It actually has its own Wikipedia page. Okay. So yeah, you'll be responsible for all that and aggregate it all into something new and even more valuable because the business wants to extract knowledge out of the information. And the way that they do that is they can in different sets of data. By the way, that's your project, final project, right? Okay. All right, so now we're gonna go off and have an activity. Um, and so I'm gonna come off and pretend that I think there's 20 of us. Okay, so we're gonna come off, remember your number, please. One, two, three, four, five. Seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Right. So if you're in the first group of ones who are ten, you're on this side. In the second, ones who are ten, you're on that side. Now just say it. I could have, but I, I need those. You will need to remember your number, so remember your number, please. So, oh, this okay. side, you're going to be. You're going to stay in this side and we don't get involved. That's like step one. Uh, I'd rather you not. Thanks. For it. If you need paper, I can give you paper. Okay, so once you've read over your role, and you remember your number, find the person who has the same number as you in this group. Oh, 
So you're you have a difference of opinion. Are you both employees? We'll take one more minute and we'll come back. So let's come back to our desk. So this, this to me is a very personally relevant uh, exercise because it happens all the time for me. So um, typically, you know, somebody did something and then different people have different perspectives on whether that was a valid thing to do. And there's usually disagreement and it's because someone has a different perspective on what right is. And so then you get into this messy 
social political situation of like, you know, does the person who is right because of the political authority, maybe they're higher up in the organization, right? All these different factors come into play. So it's nice that here, everyone's a student, there's no power differential. But where this gets super messy is like, I'm down at the very lowest rank of the organization. I'm at the bottom of my organization. And typically I'm pissing off people who are higher up in the organization. Make those very active. And so, you know, this question of who is right often gets muddied with like, who is, has more power and authority. So something that accounts for. The other fun thing to watch in reaction to when people disagree, often it triggers an organizational process. And so like if I'm in an organization over here and I disagree with someone over here, it doesn't get resolved between the two people who disagree. It gets resolved by the chain of command going up until they find some merging point, have some long drawn out meeting, and then policy gets created and it trickles back down. So in the, in the real world, it's the unfortunate outcome of like how disputes get resolved. Or they don't, and there's a long sort of like feud that goes on between organizations, which is also fun to be in. Okay. So, so with all of that mess that I just described, that's why people are very reluctant to engage with you when you're not in their organization. Because they know that all these things could happen. And so normally they just ignore things. You send them an email asking, hey, I'm a data scientist in a new organization. Can I get some help on blah, blah, blah? And you know what you get? Nothing. That is the hardest response to engage with because it's not a response. And so, you know, these are the typical responses of why they ignore you. And so understanding this, like, there are some responses that you can have that are hopefully constructive. Because typically avoiding the problem isn't the right solution. All right. Uh, I won't spend any time in this class on encryption other than this one slide this entire semester. So <laughs> these are words that you should hopefully be familiar with. But if you're not, it's not my responsibility. <laughs> that was a joke because I'm in 61. Right. OK, so you should have some familiarity with this. I'm not going to cover all this. But if you have questions, I know some answers. And so um, if you do have some questioning, let me know. But I'm going to say that these are factors that you'll probably have to be responsible for. And then, uh, hopefully, if you've ever been on the internet lately, you've seen web pages that say, do you want this cookie? Yes. Right? Do you want to be tracked? Yes or no? That's a really new thing. If you're new on the internet, you've never known anything different. But uh, that became a uh, policy, like, I think, a year and a half ago or so. And so every website basically had to have that because there are Europeans on the internet. And so it's called the General Data Protection Regulation. So that's, that's, that's a legal policy that was enacted in one sort of European Union and then inflicted on everyone else across the entire world. That's, that's a pretty amazing. So privacy, I think, is becoming more important. Uh, there was also recently a California-specific policy that was created in that state. But then because there was lots of computers there and there's lots of California internet, that was inflicted across the entire internet. Local policy does have an impact. And then if you're in health insurance, it probably sometimes applies. Remember that. But all these things will keep you out of jail, so that's good. Yeah. 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 Is that a question or a So do you want to use, do you want a tracking to be installed on your computer or not? Yeah. 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 So another sort of so along with encryption, which I won't spend a lot on, I'll spend a little bit of time on anonymization. So one of the groups that we had the activity with suggested rather than sharing the data, you could have shared sort of fake data, right? So same columns, but replace all the data. Right? So that's one approach that I've navigated a lot. Another is uh, similar to that, it's called anonymization. This is where you take some information, maybe you scramble it a little bit, maybe you replace the social security number with um, some other social security number. So, like you don't actually know whose social security number is which, but they're all valid. So there's lots of different ways that you could take an, uh, a data set and make it less uh, personal, but still valid. Okay. And then often if you've been on Google Street View, you'll find people have been blurred out. And there's another example of data anonymization, because if you're cruising along in Street View and the camera took a picture of a person's face, maybe they didn't consent to be in that picture. And so Google has to go back and erase all the people from their pictures. 
that's a nice cool application of machine learning in their little street view application. All right, so even after data has been sort of protected in this manner, it's been obfuscated as to who is who, there's the risk of de-anonymization. And so there's a couple of reasons why this happens. Usually a person will have a data set and they will anonymize or attempt to anonymize that data set. But what they don't account for is the ability for other people to combine that anonymized data set with other information. That's just something that is hard to protect against. So an example of this, I'll put this on the next uh, blackboard. But there was a paper, so mm -hmm. 2008, so more than 10 years ago, there was a thing called the Netflix Prize. You ever heard of that? You've heard of Netflix, though, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so back when the Netflix was new, there was a question of like, how do we build a recommender system so that people can get connected with the right content on Netflix? It's a very valid question for business. And so they had this prize of whoever develops the best recommender system for our content wins a million dollars. That's a cool prize. It was machine learning, so it was cool 10 years ago. And so there were a bunch of people who took this data and tried to write the best recommender. That was the intent of the prize. So Netflix, they, in order to facilitate this, provided a bunch of movie watching histories of individuals on Netflix. And so you need some starting data to run the, the sort of test on to see whether your recommender is good or not. So Netflix had provided all this information about who watched what movies, but they had escaped all the personal information. So I couldn't figure out like Ben watched movie X, you know, Y and Z, and someone else watched movies X, A and B, right? And so like that information was personally identifiable, Netflix anonymized it. And then this paper, so these people, they weren't participating in the prize, they were, you know, playing the different game of how do we take the Netflix anonymized data and figure out who was watching what movies? Which, you know, typically you wouldn't be super sensitive about, so it's kind of a cool exercise, but sometimes there are movies that you don't want, that you don't want other people knowing that you watch. That was sort of like the, 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 the risk here. So they went off, you know, I'll post that paper on Blackboard, but basically by combining different data sources, you can sometimes de-anonymize data. So protecting against that is hard because typically from your data scientist perspective, you're only operating with the data set that you have. Okay, so this is, if that wasn't a sufficient story, here's my favorite. So um, there was a, yeah, so this is for the state of Massachusetts, and this organization released some anonymized data on state employees. So they, they, you know, they have a huge data set of all the state employees from Massachusetts, and they anonymize the data, so they obviously things, and they release it um, for every single possible. Now, if you're a data scientist and you're Wiley, you're like, hmm, what can I do with that data? And so a, a researcher, um, so they had protected patient privacy by anonymizing the data. But there was a person who took the information that the governor of Massachusetts lived in this state, and in that state has, sorry, the city has 54,000 people in seven states. And so that person took another data set that they had access to, the voter record. So the voter records have the name and the address of every single person. Is registered to vote, and obviously the governor is registered to vote. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that means we can combine uh, a bunch of things like the the records, um, their sex, their birthday, um, the address, the zip code, and combine that with the anonymized data, and show uh, the governor, um, so which hospital records from the anonymized data set were his. So, so like that's egg on your face, right? If you're, if you're the governor of a state who's released this public data set of all the state employee records and your health data set gets released, not what you probably intend to do. So this is like, <laughs> think super hard about solving problems like this before you sort of like go release them into the wild, thinking you're doing a good thing. Okay. So you should or should not, is that, so I'm, again, I'm not telling you what the right thing to do is, but I'm really trying to plant the seed of awareness in your brain that this could happen. That's my intent. I don't know what the consequence for the governor was. I don't know whether he got elected the next cycle. <laughs> All right, so, it could, so that was sort of like a, a nice little story, but it's not the worst thing that happens. 
to me, a little more significant is that almost every company that holds data on you is selling it to some other company. Um, and so this, again, as a data scientist, you'll likely be in the role of having some data and need it combined with something else, and so that you'll go off and buy that other data. And so was that data collected in a reasonably ethical manner? That's a question most people don't ask. They're just like, I need this data to make my product a success. I'll just buy it, and I try and will not think about where it came from. And that's, that's the usual attitude. There's a whole market, again, uh, I have a friend who is in that market, and it's super sketchy, so I recommend against. Yeah, it is. All right. So the last, sort of, I think the last sort of thing I'll warn you against is that as a data scientist, I try and maintain my own personal integrity about how data gets used. Because to me, one of the worst use cases is like someone has an argument that they know what the solution is. Now they need the data to back it up. If someone, so if someone presents you with that concept A, you can check. Do you know what you're asking for? Because that's really bad. And then the second option is run away. Like, <laughs> you just leave. Okay. So yeah, I'll give some. <laughs> this is a a placeholder for me to remind you about um, and a lesson about. If you're trying to use data and, and you don't think ahead about it, you get in trouble. So this is the case where Target, um, Target is a store where you buy things. <laughs> so, so they have all of your history of buying things. OK, so now we've got a data set, right? <laughs> so what can we do with that data set? Well, if we're smart, what we can do is we could uh, try and predict what the person's going to buy next, right? And then send them coupons for that thing so that they uh, come to our store and buy more things. It sounds reasonable, right? As a, as a scientist, I could totally see that happen. And so uh, this target also happens to have all the addresses, so they know where to send the coupons, obviously, right? If you've signed up for the target rewards account. That's not an endorsement, just saying it happens. <laughs> and so um, there was a, uh, a person who was a young woman who was living with her parents. She shopped at Target, and based on her product history, they started sending her coupons for diapers and, and bottles and things that you would need for a baby. But I don't think she was an adult yet, and she certainly wasn't married, and she was living with her parents. And so the mail went to her parents' house where she lives, which was read by her parents. Yeah, so, so again, this is, these are hard things to think about, right? They're like edge cases in your data science portfolio, but they're really important because they impact people's lives. So again, was it the right thing to try and make a prediction to get more sales? In a business sense, absolutely. But trying to figure out all the consequences of that, it's very messy. Okay, so that's like a cautionary tale. All right. And then it's another thing to think about. I'm gonna just, I don't have a good picture to go with this. Mechanical Turk is a thing. Anybody heard of it? No, okay. So what, what you think is machine learning is often a human doing a thing and then it's being called machine learning. And so what I mean by that is like, for instance, if, if you have an Amazon Echo or what's the Google one? Google Home, right? So you speak into that speaker, and then it goes off into the internet, and they do a thing for you. And now your naive assumption is, oh, that was the magic of you know Amazon or Google doing the machine translation from voice to transcription to take an action. Sometimes it's not. And sometimes it's actually a human listening to your voice to figure out what is it that the person said, and they write it in their computer, and then they go press, you know, Google, and they're this or <laughs> Yes, this is good. I burst your bubble, right? They hire so, people to do that? Yes, people get paid to do that. And, and, and so why would you need to do that, right? It's because AI is not magic. You need a training data set with labeled data. How do you get labeled data? You take input data, and you label it, right? So you need some way of figuring out <laughs> Yes, you need the training data. And so where do you get training data? Well, humans have to decode it. So then that means that the data that you're saying, some of it, you know, a small section of it probably is like a very small portion of it, gets actually and listened to and labeled. Is that what you intended to do as a customer? Absolutely not, right? You, you, you probably don't think ahead about the fact that your data can be listened to by another human. Because some of those things can be real personal, right? I'll just tell you the end of <laughs> so, 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 so when you, 
So, so the point here is when you think something is AI, it might not be. Is it, <laughs> so great question. Is it legal? Who here has read the terms of service? <laughs> oh, come on, you didn't read the terms of service? Really? <laughs> come on. It's, of course it's, you know, why would the company have a, probably a large organization full of lawyers to address exactly that question? <laughs> yes, so <laughs> that's why you sign away your life with the terms of service. All right, so this is the last sort of, I think, uh, exercise for you. And then, yeah. So if you don't have paper again, I'll get you some paper. Uh, we're doing we're doing uh, ones and twos again. So let's turn off by ones uh, by one through ten again. I'll put on the other side here first. Yeah, I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna try and make it different. All right. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine, eight, eight, one, eight. There they go. Ten in the back. Okay. Now you got the numbers. Arrow. Oh, okay. There's no difference. My bad. <laughs> what? Is it? Ah, yeah, yeah. Totally waste my time. <laughs> Ah, oh, my bad. All right. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 
happens on my grand session. Right. So, so two options there. One is to like adapt to the local right. environment. The other would be maybe to main, continue to maintain your stance in spite of the Maybe that management doesn't actually know that they're underperforming, and maybe yeah, it's by exactly. the resources. One more on this one? So, like, I can figure out where they're coming from. curiosity allows the person to explain 
Yeah, I had a really tough time. My grandma died. You know, my dad is living at home with me now. I have three kids. I'm a single mom. Like all of these things, which made me logistically impeding their ability to actually participate 100%. So it's maybe not that they're lazy or stupid, they're all the valid reasons, but maybe they just have other things going on in life besides work, right? Just do whatever thing. So, I think that's all I got. So uh, it is 9.40, it is the end of class, and I do not have a homework for you this week. Woo! You still have your final project. The final project is still coming up. So After the presentation. Yes. Is there? I, yeah. Okay. Any other questions on things you might care about? Okay. Thank <laughs> you.